Good morning. Aren't you glad to be in church this morning? It's so great to see all of you. Are you ready to worship the Lord this morning? How about stand up? Take full advantage of this time. We have songs about the name of Jesus. We're just going to give him all the praise that he deserves. God. Here we go, sing it out. Our God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground, as nations rise and fall. Kingdoms were strong now shaken, we trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. Oh, we trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Come on, church, sing it out. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice you will reign. And every knee will bow. So we bring our expectations. Our hope is anchored in your name. The name of Jesus. Oh, we trust the name of Jesus. You are the only king forever. Almighty God. You higher, you are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. victorious. He's given us the victory as well. Amen. Aren't you glad you have victory through the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords?
Psalm 113 says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. There is power in the name of Jesus. Yeah, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is
have no equal. You're the one that breaks the chains. It's the power of your name that does that. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but the name, your name, Jesus. And so we praise your holy name. And I ask if there's anyone here today that needs some chains broken in their lives that they'll just give their self to you and allow you to break those chains and to give them new life. You're the one that does that. And so we praise you. Stir our hearts today, Jesus. Make us more like you. Be glorified through what we do in your name. We love you. We pray this, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Let's get into the word a little bit. 2 Samuel chapter number 19. What a beautiful name it is. Thank you, Lord, Jesus Christ. It's uh, that old line that old preacher used to say, we're just uh, having choir practice for heaven. And when you have an opportunity to sing, uh, you should just sing it out and be able to sing Praises unto the Lord, and blessed be the name of the Lord. What a beautiful name it is. And just go on and on. What a wonderful name. King David knew Jesus Christ. He understood who he was, who he was in the present tense in his life, and who he was going to be in his life in eternity. When Jesus Christ... <clears throat> really, really became his everything. I know you have the anointing, you have all the things that went on in David's life, but if you track back to the seventh chapter of Second Samuel and you see the covenant that God, the Lord God Almighty, bestows on David, 
in the Davidic covenant is put in place, which is the prelude and the forerunning covenant to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you realize they had a really intimate relationship. Thus, when we look at the name of our series, uh, there's nothing that is beyond his grace. David understood that. In his reign, as king, though, of 40 years, boy, he went through it. From the ups and the downs to the ins and the outs. And, of course, it was a marked change in his life from the moment of the, of course, little sins or other sins or how you want to have big sins. I'm not just putting an adjective on them, just the sin of Bathsheba with Bathsheba. From that point on, of course, God held back by his grace and mercy the judgment that it could have been on this earth to take his life because uh, adultery was punished uh, by stoning. But David, David was allowed by the Lord to continue in his reign in Jerusalem. He was allowed to fulfill a lot of what God had assigned him to do. But through that, of course, he, he had a family. And it's often said that David was a much better king, warrior, soldier than he was a family man or a father. And uh, from the results of many things that happened in his family, I believe that we have enough evidence to say he had an awful lot of victories on the battlefield, but he had most of his defeats came in his home. I want you to think today as we go into 2 Samuel 19 of where we were last week, of how at the end of chapter number 18 in 2 Samuel, this is a great high point for David. Don't you love when you, you put everything into something and there's a victory? And for this one, of course, it's King David, father, versus King David, excuse me, King Absalom, son, and they are at war. They have a fight, a battle, a big war. What goes before the war, of course, is the death of Ahithophel, his own suicide. He takes his own life. He is broken by the counsel uh, uh, that he has given. It's not taken by Absalom. Of course, he has turned his back on David, who he was the right-hand counselor for. He sided with Absalom. He also, of course, was in a place of revenge and wanting to get back at David for the adultery he had with Bathsheba, which was his grandchild. And so you think about all the things that went on here. David's in the place now where this battle with his son it, it, it is tenuous and it's difficult and it's hard and it's, it's an awful thing. And he is really just tore up about it all. But he ends up having victory. And we ended in chapter number 18 with him having victory. But at the end of chapter 18, as we, we looked at that and we saw that, we go, wow, David really, and we used this as an introductory piece last week in the beginning of our message, and I just want to give you some context. In the midst of this incredible victory, it's not like, okay, well, we had really a high ups and high downs. No, in the midst of the victory. So it was a gain and a loss. At the same time, he lost his son, Absalom. David returns as king of Israel, but he is so, so distressed. He is so heavy-hearted because of the loss of his son. The king should just stand up, take back the throne. Everybody gave up everything for him, for his leadership. They wanted him to be back in as king. By the way, don't you want Jesus Christ back in as king? You say he hasn't left that seat or that office of reigning over because he's at the right hand of the Father, yes, but he's going to come to reign right here. Now you say, well, I can't wait for the rapture. That's cool. I can't wait for the second coming because it's going to be a mighty thing. It's going to be a thousand years millennial reign. It's going to be a thousand years of woo I want the king to come back, and I'm waiting on the king. We ought to be waiting on the king because this nation of Israel, they're waiting on the king. They want the king, David, to take his rightful spot. But he's forlorn. As it says at the end of chapter 18, I got it up on the screen, and the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said these famous words, O oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. And Joab's about, about to, to uh, a boat. I did a little uh, different uh, language there. A boat? Minnesota? No, I don't want to be from Minnesota. I played there. It was a lot nicer place than it is now. Uh, that's a sidebar. Sorry about that. But he says, oh, my son Absalom, my son, 
my son Absalom, would God had died for thee. Excuse me, would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. Joab's going to bring these words back at him. You mean to tell me that all that we did, you'd rather have yourself die and we have no king and have Absalom as king? No way. It says in verse number 4 of chapter 19, we're going to get into it here in one minute, but the king covered his face. Again, a picture of grief and sorrow, distress and forlorn. The people could not see him. Remember, he is in Mahahanan. He is not in Jerusalem yet. This is where they did battle from after he was exiled and he got out of Jerusalem, but now he's back in Mahahanan and he is waiting on his victory march into the city. But he's delaying it because the king covered his face and the king cried with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. He just can't get over it. But the people want the king to stand up. The king want listen, just stand up, get into where you belong. We want you back. We gave up everything for you. We're on your side. But the people, they start getting distressed too. There starts to become strife. There's contention now because we really don't have any king. Those that follow Absalom, they get no king. Those that are following David, he's not standing up. You see, leadership brings many, many, many pieces to the call. And one of the big ones is, the old phrase goes, when you're in leadership, lead. If you have been put in a place where you are supposed to be the king, lead. Because David, in your absence, things are falling apart. I used this phrase before. I, I'm glad I don't have certain people that are in our gathering today. But uh, if they're online, then they can send me an email and correct it. Oh, wait a minute. Courtney's here. Oh, English, English genius. English genius. As I said before, stuckness is not good. Is that okay? That's not very good. No, so even the terminology is not good. You see, David's stuck. And that's how we walk through these next few words in your Bible. Consider David is stuck, needs to be unstuck, and God's about to unstuck him, and he's going to decide, I need to put this thing back together. But it starts out with this part here. Verse number 1, chapter number 19, with all that he's stuck on, all that he's hanging up on, and all those around him that say, come on now, you need, you need, you need to do something here. We're about to see how Joab, on his side of it's going, you need to get it together, king. And David's saying, I don't need to get it together, and I just don't feel like it. Verse number one. And it was told Joab, behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people. For the people heard say that day how the king was grieved for his son. They're supposed to be having a, a celebration over being victorious. And of course, they are now looking at this thing going, wait a minute. Our victory was turned into mourning. Verse 3, the people got them by stealth that day into the city as people being ashamed steal away when they flee in a battle. They're like, we're just going to, we're not sure what we're going to do, so we're just going to come toward the city. We're going to just kind of, we don't want to be make a big announcement because we're not sure if we should be victorious or should we be sad. What a terrible, difficult place to put people in. King, we're waiting for you. Take your spot on the throne. Verse 4 again king covered his face. The king cried with a loud voice, Oh, my son Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Verse 5, here we go. Joab comes into the house here. He came into the house and he says, Thou hast shamed this day the faces of all thy servants which this day have saved thy life. They've saved you. The lives of thy sons and of thy daughters and of thy wives and thy wives and the lives of thy concubines in that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. What is the matter with you? All these people who have stood up for you, he's really taken it to him. He's putting it right back on him. You, David, all these people, we've brought it and got it back for you. Verse 6. In that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends, for thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceive, Joab saying to David, that if Absalom had lived and all we had died this day, then it had pleased thee well. Now therefore arise. 
Go forth and speak comfortably unto thy servants. For I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night. That will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befell thee from thy youth until now. It'll be worse for you. It'll be the worst moment of your life. Since you were a child, if you don't get back on the throne where you belong, if Jesus Christ was never going to come back, we have. We're miserable, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15. If we have hope just in Jesus Christ crucified, no hope. It's done. But we have hope in Jesus Christ, a resurrected and coming back. And that hope drives us. It would be worse than anything if you and I found out Jesus wasn't coming back again. we ship it out. I'd be done. I'd be done. I'm so counting on him. I'm so counting on him. That's what they were doing. David, we need you back. We've done all that we could, but you need to step up. So verse number eight. And by the way, David doesn't know yet in our text that Joab's the one who killed his son. You'll find out here in a few verses that it comes to light because he makes Amasa, Amasa the new captain of the guard and he puts Joab away. But Joab, good or bad, or the way you want to see him and the way he's confronting here, he's got a lot of good traits. But the one thing he is loyal to is himself and the other thing he's loyal to is his army. And thirdly, he's loyal to the nation. He likes being the king the king's army, uh, the captain of the army, he likes that part. And that's why he took out Absalom, because he wanted this country, these people, the nation of Israel, to have David as king. You can't beat that one. That's a good thing. But we know that Joab's future coming out and playing out in the next couple of chapters is not going to be good. By the way, he's about to take out somebody else, too. He's going to get a massa too. He's going to get that guy that replaced him because David is going to put him in charge of the guard. Verse, uh, verse 8, the king arose, sat in the gate. They told him all the people, saying, Behold, the king does sit in the gate. Yahoo! Well, hang on. And all the people came before the king, for Israel had fled every man to his tent. So they're coming before the king, but still there's some hesitancy. So watch this part. The next part here is that Judah goes to Gilgal to meet the king. Have you come up with any answers for me, Ben, since, okay. Gilgal is a very important place. Gilgal, Jordan, the River Jordan, the gathering place to gather and go and go over. So this is a really important spot here. It represents so much. We don't have time to go into it. But here they're going to meet at Gilgal because they're going to go back over the river, Jordan, and they're going to get back to Jerusalem, which is not far. Judah is the root tribe of David. Judah, Benjamin, against the ten tribes, Israel. Division, at the end of this chapter we'll see contention. It's already been brewing, even long ago. And it gets really bad through the end of David's reign. Solomon holding it together, but after Solomon goes, Jeroboam, Rehoboam the son, the battle over the divided kingdom of Israel. So think about this as Judah comes to play here because it's very, very important how David deals with Judah. All the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel saying in verse number 9, the king saved us out of the hand of our enemies and he delivered us out of the hand of the Philistines. That's wonderful. And now he has fled out of the hand of the, uh, the land of Absalom. I mean, get him back. Verse 10, Absalom, who we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, now this is the cornerstone of our message in the last 10 minutes when we really make some practical stuff. But this is what the Spirit of God put on me. This phrase right here, this verse, verse number 10. Now, therefore, why, church, speak ye not a word of bringing the king back? What's happened to us? Why are we not speaking a word about the king coming back? Why are you not talking about the king coming back? Because the signature piece about David coming back in picture and type of Jesus Christ is that when he gets back on the throne, we know everything's all right. Unity's coming back together. Restoration's coming back together. The te everything's going to come back together, right? 
the Ark of the Covenant, Jerusalem, everything, worship, everything's going to be right, right? See, why are we not talking about the king coming back? Other than, hey, I sure hope he gets us out of here real quick. Wait a minute here. Come on now. This is important here. So watch how this plays out. Judah, the interaction at Gilgal. The king, David, sent to Zadok and to Abathar the priest, saying, Speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, Why are ye last to bring the king back to his house, seeing the speech of all Israel has come to the king, even to his house? Because they're holding back. They were loyal, of course, to Absalom. Now they want to make things right, and they want to come back and follow David. They want to do what's right. So they want to come back and find things the way they ought to be. So David now sends his priest to be able to say, Hey, Judah, let's do this. Verse 12. Ye are my brethren, ye are my bones and my flesh. Wherefore then are ye the last to spring back the king? That's a whole other package with uh, Jesus to the Jew. Okay, we'll leave this. There's so much here. Verse number 13. And ye, excuse me, and say ye to Amasa, Art thou not of my bone and of my flesh, Benjaminite? God do so to me, uh, excuse me, Judite, and more also, if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. Amasa, you're taking the place of Joab. That kind of gives you an idea that David's found out over the last few moments who took his son out. Because he's replaced Joab. You said it's a little bit of a political move. It's also a loyalty move. Because Judah now sees him making a move to bring them back and give them a comfort and the thought that, hey, we're going to be all right. The kingdom's going to come back together. That's when you know that God's at work, when people are doing godly moves that honor the Lord to get, to, to get us in a place where the church is saying, I can't wait for the king, I can't wait for the king, the king is going to be coming back, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, can't wait for the king, because, you know what, that tribulation period is going to go like, with that thousand year millennial reign, woohoo, as we come back. So all this going on, verse number 14 and 15, this is powerful in verse 14. And he bowed the heart of all the men of Judah, even as the heart of one man, so that they sent this sword unto the king, return thou and all thy servants. Powerful statement. The king is the unifier. The king is the restorer. The king is the rebuilder. Is he not? That's Jesus Christ. This is David bowing the heart of everyone in Judah and saying, let's do this. Because they had to see David the king making the step forward and reaching out with that hand of reconciliation. This is how we see the king in operation. So the king returned in verse number 15 and came to Jordan. Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king to conduct the king over Jordan. So then verse number 16 down through 23. Watch this. Shemei and Ziba show up. They greet the king. Neither one of them has a good history with the king, but now we see how the king brings reconciliation in another way. We're about to see him sp spend time also with a man named Barzillai. Now, Barzillai was part of a bunch of people that came and refreshed David and his army before they went to battle. But Shimei and Ziba both represent deceit. Coming to David for something to get something, chapter number 16. And you remember the Shimei came when David was on exile. I'm just trying to give you a background, so I read it through. David was in exile, running away from the kingdom because Absalom had taken the throne. And Shimei showed up and dogged him and cursed him and threw stones at him and took advantage of that time frame. 2 Samuel 16, around verses 5 down through 12 or 13, 14, around there. Also, just before that, we knew that Ziba showed up. Ziba deceived Mephibosheth, who he is supposed to care for, from the house of Saul. Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, grandson. So as that all gives you some background, you realize that Ziba is not a good guy toward David because he wanted something from David, and he manipulated the circumstances to misrepresent Mephibosheth, and David granted him all the land that should have been just Mephibosheth's. So again, two men show up. And how does David handle it? Restoration, reconciliation, putting things back together. The kindness of David comes. We see the king coming back to play here in the way he is. Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjaminite, which was a Behuram. 
hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba the servant of the house of Saul, and his fifteen sons and his twenty servants with him. And they went over Jordan before the king. And there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household and to do what the good, they thought good. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down. Look at this beautiful repentance. Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan and said unto the king, Let not my lord impute iniquity unto me. Who is your imputation? Jesus Christ. His blood is shed for you. It imputes so that it washes away your iniquity. He's in picture a repentant, asking for forgiveness, broken sinner. He's coming, from, coming to a place where he needs salvation. Please, verse number 19, he's saying, Neither do thou remember that thy servant did perversely the day that my Lord, the king, went out of Jerusalem, and the king should take it to his heart. Verse 20, for thy servant doth not... Excuse me, doth know that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I am come the first this day of the house of Joseph to go down to meet my lord the king. Of course, Abishai, always being the one that likes to come around and take everybody's head off, nephew Abishai says, Okay, hey, Abishai, the son of Zariah, answered and said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? <laughs> he said the same thing back there before. He wants him. <laughs> Don't mess with my king. David says, no, I don't need any adversaries from Zariah. Verse number 22. What have I to do with thee, you sons of Zariah, that ye should this day be adversaries unto me? Shall there any man be put to death this day in Israel? For do not I know that I am this day king over Israel? Therefore the king said unto Shimei, thou shalt not die, and the king swear unto him. There's not going to be any death today. There is going to be reconciliation today. Everybody that was against me, I am reconciling them. I am extending mercy like the God of the universe extended to me when he could have taken my life after my sin. Though I have paid and I've had to pay for those, con and those consequences that have come in my life, I am going to extend mercy and I'm going to show Zim uh, Shimei and Ziba this mercy because Mephibosheth is going to show up. Watch Mephibosheth show up and now you've got him being dealt with by kindness, mercy, goodness. Why did he do this? Why in the world is the king doing this? See, David had a giving heart, a kind spirit. He had a unifying strategy, and it produced success. Great leaders are effective at their strategy. Great leaders are effective in fulfilling their purposes. You may not agree with them, but when the leader is leading, when the king is doing what he's doing, you may not agree with anything that God's doing or half the things that God's doing or just 10%. But when God does what he's going to do, he's leading, he's very effective. David's being very effective at restoring the kingdom back. He's doing his part. He's doing what the people are asking him to do. So here we have Mephibosheth show up and then Barzillai. Verse number 24, Mephibosheth greets the king. The son of Saul came down to meet the king and neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. That's a sign and a signal that Ziba was not taking care of him. Understand that. Which now David figures this out and goes, wait a minute, Ziba's supposed to take care of this handicapped man who is the son, grandson, in the house of Saul, who is the son of Jonathan whom he loved who he's extended goodness to, and he's given things to, and he's promised land and everything to. Ziba's interrupted because Ziba misrepresented him earlier. Verse 25, it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, watch this, what humility. My lord or king, my servant deceived me. That's Ziba. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass, that I may ride thereunto, and go to the king, because thy servant is lame, and he hath slandered thy servant unto my lord, the king. But, my lord, the king, is an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine own eyes. Wow. I entrust myself to you, God, in whatever you decide to do. I entrust myself to you, David, a type of Jesus Christ. In this setting right here, as God has brought salvation in picture 
to Shimei. Now Mephibosheth goes to David on behalf of his servant. Verse 28, For all of my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king, yet didst thou set thy servant among them that did eat at mine own table. What right, thine own table, what right therefore have I yet to cry any more unto the king? And the king said unto him, Why speakest thou any more of these matters? I have said, Thou and Ziba divide the land. He made a reconciliatory move. He say he went back on his word. Whatever take you want to make, at this point I just see the heart of David wanting to reconcile matters and restore this kingdom and not let the little stuff get in the way of the big stuff. Because we want the king to return. We need to deal with the little stuff properly and as according to what God would show you to do by scripture, by God's grace, by God's mercy, fine. But this is David's call. Verse 30, Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all. For as much as my lord, the king has come again in peace unto his own house. Wow, what humility in Mephibosheth. What a beautiful picture of a broken-hearted servant of the Lord. And that's some of you in this church that would do anything in the world for anyone else. If God would grant that someone would have to have something and according to something, and you say, let them have everything. I do not need it. So here, the last couple pieces of the chapter, and you'll have covered the most verses you've ever covered in a Sunday morning ever. Here we go. So here is Barzillai. Bars, bar, zil, I. Barzillai. If you went back to, again, earlier in our text, 2 Samuel 17, I believe, is where you would find him with a couple of others, again, that blessed David and his army and refreshed them with food before they went into battle against Absalom. So here he comes back again, seeing the king. And it represents, again, another faction of people. God shows David's incredible heart for all peoples. While the tribes of Israel are contending against one another, they're pridefully trying to fight for their own ground and being closer to the king than anyone else. Barzillai, again, comes like a man like Mephibosheth. He says he's only 80 years old. He's a young guy. Verse 32, he's a very aged man. He had provided the king of sustenance while he was in Mahanaim. And remember, Mahanaim was the headquarters of them rallying together for their battle against Absalom and where they had returned and where this story, this account started in the first few verses today. But now they moved to Gilgal over the Jordan and now they're headed into Jerusalem. You see, they're getting back. That's what happened while we were covering the last 15, 20 minutes. See, so here they are. Verse 33. Excuse me, verse 32, let's not forget this phrase. For he was a very great man. You don't hear that about a lot of people. Oh, he's a great man. He's a, a very great man. And the king said unto Barzillai, Come thou over with me, I will feed thee. Barzillai, he says, eh, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do this. I don't want anything. He says in verse number 34, how long have I to live that I should go up to the king in Jerusalem? I am this day fourscore years old. Can I discern between good and evil anymore? Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I do? Can I hear anymore? The voice of singing men and women. Wherefore, then should thy servant be ye a burden unto the Lord and the king? He doesn't want to be a burden anymore. By the way, this is a sweet man in his older age saying, I don't want to be a burden to anybody. Then there's others when they get into older age, they're going... Give me, give me, give me, take care of, give me, give me. Unfortunately, in our nation, we're not treating older people properly like they ought to be. Many of them are like Barzillai. He doesn't want to be a burden on anybody. David says, I'll take care of you, I'll take care of you. He says, I don't want anything. He says, well then, could you take care of my servant? Take care of my servant for me. Would you do that? Verse 36, I servant will go a little way over Jordan with the king. Why should the king recompense it with thee such a reward? Verse 37. Let thy servant, I pray thee, turn back again that I may die in mine own city. Saying, hey, me as your servant, king, just let me go back and die. But behold, verse, uh, verse 37 in the middle, but behold thy servant, Shimhan, let him 
and I believe it might be pronounced Kimham, but Kimham, let him go over with my lord the king and do to him what shall seem good unto thee. And the king answered, Kimham shall go over with me, and I will do that, do to him that which seem good unto thee. And whosoever thou shalt require of me, that will I do for thee. And all the people went over Jordan. When the king was come, he kissed Barzillai. And he says, I bless thee. I bless thee. A very great man, it says in verse 32. And he returned to his own palace, and the king went on to Gilgal. And Kimham went on with him, and all the people of Judah conducted the king. And all, also half the people of Israel. Things are coming together. What beauty in this king. This is what your king, Lord Jesus, will do. Peace will come. There will be no fighting, no more sorrow, no more pain. No more. No be no more wars. We're waiting on the king. But of course, there's still contention and strife. We need to just make sure of that in our last little part here the last few verses of the chapter, just to be reminded that man is man and we are, we are prideful people. Only by pride cometh contention, right? But with the well-advised is wisdom. Verse 41, here's Israel, tribes of Israel, going against Judah and arguing and fighting. Nyeh, we're so mad that you favor Judah. We're the ones who need to be with you. Verse 41 says, the people of Israel came to the king and said unto the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen thee away and have brought the king and his household and all David's men with him over Jordan? Verse 42. And all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Hey, because the king is near of kin, he's, he's of us to us. Wherefore then, why are you angry? Why, wherefore then be ye angry? For this matter, have we eaten at all the king's costs, or hath he given us any gift? Is he, is he lavishing us with stuff? Are we getting something in return for taking care of the king? We're not. We're giving our lives for him, just like you say you want to. Why are we having this contention over a matter that we both agree on, which is let's get the king back where he belongs on the throne of Jerusalem, and let's get things back to the way the kingdom is supposed to be run. But of course, verse number 43, the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, we have ten parts in the king. <laughs> We have, hey, we got our ten tribes. You got Judah and Benjamin. And we also have more right in David than ye. Really? Why then did ye despise us that our advice should not be first in the bringing back of our king? And the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. Seriously? Sidebar, you getting louder and being more fierce is not going to win the fight there, husbands. <laughs> parent over children they raise your their voice you raise your what are we doing here well let me make let me be more fierce against you that's what judah and israel did again that's a precursor to the way things are going to be the king is coming are you waiting on the king because when we see and witness the text and how much david means to how things are going to be better and how he just needs to get where he belongs. Putting the kingdom back together. It's just quite really never there on this earth. But when Jesus Christ comes, he will put the kingdom back together exactly the way it ought to be. David's going to make it better than the division they had in the civil war they had. But again, waiting on the king. So I've got ten minutes. you got ten minutes with me? Stay in with us. Stay in with us. Just a few minutes. I want you to see and understand from this text some really strong practical stuff that comes down to us personally as followers in Jesus Christ as a church corporately and also too in that outside world out there why does the Lord tarry his coming I believe there's three things here here's our first one King Jesus delays his return while the suffering world becomes more dire and more desperate. You say it's pretty bad out there. By my Bible account, it's supposed to be more dire and more desperate. Really? Oh, yeah. Peter said it. 
in reference to a tribulation setting, but Paul said it to Timothy in a setting for the church with the understanding. So things are going to progressively get worse. Do you know exactly how it's going to lay out? I do not know. That's not my thing. But I know that even Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter number 24, you shall hear of wars and rumors of war, see that not but trouble, for all these things must come to pass. For nation shall rise up against nation. All these things the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver up to the afflicted and they shall kill you. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of stuff is going to lay down. I know we had the tribulation period. I know that we had the rapture calling out the church. But please understand that Jesus Christ delays his return while the suffering world becomes more dire and more desperate. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3. If you don't find it that quickly, that's fine. You continue to turn there. I put this passage up on the screen. We're going to use chapter 3, chapter 2, chapter 1 over the next few moments to have you understand and have me understand that the Bible is clear about these three pieces of why Jesus Christ tarries and we wait. And so Jesus delays his return while the suffering world becomes more dire and more desperate. Watch this. This know also. Paul telling Timothy, please know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. It gets worse. Without natural affection, truce breakers, fa false accusers, incontent, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For this sort are they which keep, creep into houses. It just goes on and on and on. Paul's telling Timothy, perilous times are coming. You say, I know this passage, and, and you just read it flippantly. Look at each part of it. Lovers of their own selves, disobedient to parents, unthankful, incontinent. <laughs> this is a man's inability to control, inability to control his own appetite. His appetite, and we have addictions everywhere. People are incontinent. Food, drugs, alcohol, it doesn't matter. This is where we live. King Jesus delays his return while the suffering world becomes more dire and desperate. And they need to be more desperate and more dire. And it needs to get worse and worse. You say, really? That's what the Bible says. Go read Romans chapter number 1 as well and some other passages of Scripture. And you'll see it. What else happens? To tell us that Jesus Christ is coming, but he delays his coming. Now this is going to become a little bit more personal. Here we go. King Jesus. He delays his return while the hearts of his people wax gross and more sinful. Now, he says that in reference to and from Isaiah and also at the end of Acts and other places in God referencing his people, Israel. I'm just saying it to you and me, his people. You see, we believers, the body of Christ, we are his people. What are we doing? Our hearts wax gross. Just like Paul warned the Jews that rejected Jesus Christ at the end of Acts 28. The heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have closed. And he goes on and on. He says, hey, Jews, the salvation of God is going to be sent to the Gentiles now. That's it. There'll be Jews that'll be saved, but the missionary work of Paul continues to press on through all the others that he reproduced himself in while he's ending his life in jail. From Timothy and on, 2 Timothy chapter number 2, it's loaded with so much great teaching, but let's grab a handle on verses 24 through 26. Here we go. Keep in mind... Keep in mind that Peter said in 2 Peter 3, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in holy, all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of, the Lord, of God. We are supposed to be living in such a way God and godliness that it, it just ushers in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, it's our disobedience that prolongs our wait for the king. It says in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verses 24 through down through 26. Now as I read it, follow along, I know it's up on the screen. 
And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patient. Why? Because in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You know people that are lost, that oppose themselves, they don't know what to believe, what not to believe, they're having a fight with inside, they don't know whether to believe God or not believe God. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him and his will. That's you and me. That's what we have to do. That relates so deeply to my inner core. That pierces me. King Jesus delays the return while the hearts of his people wax gross and more sinful when we're supposed to be more godly, have holy conversation, hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, the day of God. The percentage of people that speak the English language, the percentage of people that speak other languages, the percentage of people that have the word of God in their hands to be able to read it. I know it's gotten better and better in the last 20 years, but still... Have we witnessed and brought the message of the Lord Jesus Christ to everybody? What's going on, believers? We're his missionaries. We're his ambassadors. So I finish with this thought. Chapter number one, 2 Timothy. King Jesus delays his return while waiting on our submission and obedience to his vision. What's his vision? Well, there's a sign on the back of the wall right there. That's his vision. It translates into our feet, moving on mission. And ye shall be my witnesses. Ye, I'm going to give you power in the Holy Ghost that you may go Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part. Well, I just want Jesus to come back. I just want him. I know, but for what reason are you saying that? To get you out of your responsibility? Church, let's get some revival from the Lord and a personal worship from the Lord and restore to the work of the mission of the church because we need to send people all over this world. People need to go, and we need to send them. Well, let's start a church at the corner over at Adams Dairy Parkway in Manor Court. Do you really think we need another church over here? We need people to go into the world. You say, well, people in America haven't heard Jesus Christ. That's fine. But the mission and vision of God is to reach the world before he comes back. And if you really think the world's been reached yet, you're crazy. We're sloughing, slacking, me included big time. And enough. Enough. We're just getting so lazy. But we want Jesus to come back and get us out of this mess. You really think you're going to get out of a mess? We're already in a mess because people are going to hell. Big time going to hell. Big time. People I spend time with, their hope is gone. And they need to hear about Jesus Christ from you and me. I'm one, you're one, every one of us. That one person is who Paul is talking to here. He's talking to Timothy. He's not talking to the whole church, even though he wants him to translate that to his whole church that he's pastoring over. But he's talking to Timothy. And he's saying, you better get on it because you're sloughing and slacking. That's my translation. So here you go. 2 Timothy, chapter number 1. Before I have a heart attack. Here we go. Let's finish this up. Wherefore, verse number 6, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting out of my hands. He's being specific to Timothy, talking to him. So let's take it personally from the Holy Ghost right now. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, in order to have a good day tomorrow. No. Sorry. No. You say, well, that applies. It stretches a little. Good. Stretch it. How about it's not for you? It's for the Holy Ghost to work through you to remind you of the power you have in the gospel. The gospel is life-changing. So he's not giving you the spirit of fear, but of power to love and a sound mind. That's a good thing. 
As a real cool person said this week to me, there's also some really good fear of the Lord stuff that we need to pay attention to, too, because that might wake us up. But he's not giving us the spirit of fear when it comes to bringing this gospel to other people. We need to go with this. Why? Because verse number 8, 9, 10 play out really beautiful here, but they're very convicting. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. God, <laughs> what is the matter with me? It's got to change, church. Because King Jesus delays his coming. He delays his return because he's waiting for us to submit to the assignment, to the mission, to the vision of God. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Don't be ashamed of his prisoner. Don't be ashamed of each other as Christians. Don't be ashamed of your belief. Don't be ashamed of belonging to the church, the body of Christ. Stop being ashamed of me, Paul saying. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. If you and I suffer a little bit for the power, excuse me, for the gospel, it's okay. Because it's according to the power of God that it happens. That's the gospel who has saved us, who has called us with a holy calling, us, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. What a beautiful assignment by grace that we have, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who had abolished death and has brought life and mortality to life through the gospel. Whew. Jesus Christ delays his return. Do you, do you want Jesus Christ to return? Do you want him to come back? Do you? Yes. Call it the church, rapture time, we'll never have another chance. A young lady handed a book to me 15, 14 years ago. There's one thing you will not do in heaven. Cahill wrote it, I believe. You'll never witness to another person in heaven. He'll never lead another one to Christ in heaven. It'd be great to lead someone to Christ one more time, and one more time, and one more time, and one more time, and one more time. And it would be incredible, church, if we could send some young people, old people, whatever age in between, we'll send Barzillai to the mission field. I went a little long, but here we are, and I'll pray. The King of Kings delays his return. What are we doing to wait upon the Lord at his coming? Lead people to Jesus in church, but send people out to the world. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your precious and holy and perfect word. Thank you for the spirit of God's teaching, guidance, and remembrance of all things that are truth. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ giving us everything and giving everything. Thank you for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And thank you for the life of David in this passage of Scripture that reminds us that the people are looking to the King in order to restore things, put things together the way they ought to be. So, Lord, we look for you. Please come soon, Lord Jesus Christ. Even so, Lord, come quickly. We thank you for our morning and your word. We thank you for our time of being able to celebrate you. You are worthy. You are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen.